Yeah, good evening. Uh, so I would, I would like to welcome you all into today's AHN uh, Nephrology webinar. And today's series number 27. Uh, my name is Egina Francis Makwabe, if you have just joined in. Um, I'm the consultant physician and nephrologist practicing in Tanzania, and I'm working with Africa Healthcare Network as con uh, uh, chief medical director. Mm -hmm. So I'll be moderating this session together with Dr. Kajiru Kilonzo. Uh, he's from KCMC and he's a consultant physician and nephrologist. And uh, he will be the one who will be uh, introducing Professor Ioannis Mann uh, to, to lead us into this session. So uh, he will also read a short bio for Professor Mann so that everybody should know who is Professor Man. Dr. Kajiro, are you there? You are welcome, and please uh, proceed uh, with introduction to of Dr. Johannes Mann. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Makwabe, for the uh, warm introduction. And um, I would like to take this, I'm quite honored to be uh, um, uh, chairing this session, and um, I'm even more honored to introduce um, Professor Johannes Mann. Hmm? Um, uh, who since 1989 is a full professor uh, of medicine at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, and uh, the head of the of a KFH um, Kaha V uh, Kidney Center, Munich, uh, both in Germany. And uh, he's an international scholar at the Population Health Institute of McMaster University, Canada. So Professor Mann, uh, I has um, my previous assignments, um, uh, which include the uh, director of the Department of Nephrology in Munich General Hospital, uh, and has been a staff member and assistant professor of medicine and uh, of the Department of Medicine, University of Heidelberg, Germany, and also um, uh, has uh, had several research fellowships in pharmacology at the University of Montreal, Canada, and uh, of Heidelberg, Germany. Professor Mann is a board certified in internal medicine, in nephrology, and intensive care, and as well as uh, pharmacology and toxicology. I uh, was an officer in the German society, in the societies of medicine and uh, nephrology, of the International Society of Nephrology, and is the, in the, on the editorial board of the major journals of nephrology. His scientific world is impressive, which includes over 220 original papers, uh, his citations uh, rank, rank among the top 25 European nephrologists. Most of the papers published in Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, uh, were cited for more than um, 2,000 times. Yeah? So uh, the work of Professor Mann considered initially the physiology of renin angiotensin system in experimental animals, and later the role of this system for diseases of the kidney, the heart, uh, the arteries, and for diabetes and its damages. From there, his interest moved to the treatment mm, and prevention of progressive renal diseases, uh, including diabetes and hypertension, and the la latter um, planning uh, steering committee of a number of uh, data and safety monitoring boards, including some we recommend the on-target renal, transcend, sonar. Um, so I'm, I'm really, very well, uh, 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 honored uh, to introduce uh, Professor Mann. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear. yes. that's great. So thank you for this introduction. I'm very honored to be tonight the speaker of this fireplace meeting and I will start to share my screen. Um, here it is. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Wonderful. I just have to enlarge it. Sorry. Here. And tonight I'm speaking at this conference because I was and I am co-chair of the KDGO guideline on the management of high blood pressure 
in those with chronic kidney disease. And it's very important to emphasize that it's chronic kidney disease in those not on dialysis. So ND stands here for not on dialysis. And I had the pleasure to co-chair this together with Alpha and Cheung from the University of Utah in USA. Um, and I will, in the following 30 to 40 minutes, explore some of the salient findings of this KDGO um, guideline. Mm, and before I do so, I will show you my conflicts of interest, as is usually the case. I'm also, I'd like to point out, if you use it, I'm writing in up-to-date about hypertension, several chapters, also the chapter on hypertension in those with chronic kidney disease. That said, I show you on this slide, the work group which we work together, that's myself, and that's Alfred who chaired this group of wonderful scientists who did a great job in working on this guideline that we finally, and that's why it's good to talk about it today, was finally published a few days ago in Kidney National. This is um, what, uh, why we worked on a new guideline. There is a KDGO guideline 2012. KDGO is an international organization, non-governmental, um, non-for-profit organization of the international nephrologists um, whose aim is to publish guidelines on important topics in real medicine. That's KDGO. And KDGO had published a guideline on hypertension in 2012. Since then, there was uh, more work done. There was also some emphasis on the techniques of blood pressure measurement. There was, since 2012, the publication of the important SPRINT trial, a public funded trial um, by uh, the NIH in the US, uh, Sprint Mind, Sprint uh, Senior, a, a lot of data that I will show and that informed uh, our guideline come from Sprint, very important study. The, we also did uh, joint analysis of Sprint and Accord. Accord was a study exclusively in those with diabetes, with some patients with CKD, mainly without CKD. And Sprint was a study in those without diabetes. Therefore, the combined analysis is of interest. Uh, since 2012, also large meta analyses were published on CKD and non-CKD populations, and several new guidelines appeared on how to treat and how to manage mm, high blood pressure in general. And in these general guidelines, like from the American Heart Association or the European Society of Cardiology and National Guidelines, the NICE Institute from UK, all these were on general population, but they all had chapters um, on, on uh, patients with CKD. So a lot of new information since 2012. We came together in August 2018. And as I said, uh, we worked for more than yeah, two years now. It's a long effort of a lot of um, uh, good friends and collaborators uh, without any support, uh, and we published it in the guideline in Kidney International. It's online, available uh, without cost um, a few days ago, and it will be in the printed issue, will be available printed uh, in March. We, well, we are in March, so in a few days from now. To go up into the guideline itself, uh, we had an evidence review team. So independent of us as work group, we had um, an Australian group from the Cochrane Kidney Group uh, who worked uh, on the new evidence that was published since 2012. And we came together with this uh, evidence review team and defined 
critical outcomes to look for in this evidence review and important outcomes. And I will talk in the following about those outcomes. Obviously, survival, longevity is important, end stage kidney disease for us as uh, nephrologists, but also cardiovascular outcomes because many patients with CKD die of cardiovascular disease before they reach end stage kidney disease. And important <clears throat> outcome, particularly for the patient, uh, if you think of yourself, I mean, what you want to avoid in the future, it certainly is dementia and cognitive impairment. And we also defined some measurements like doubling serum creatinine and acute kidney tree and falls and fatigue as uh, outcomes to look and search for within this evidence review. Um, the guideline itself, if you look at it, has five chapters. The first is on blood pressure measurement. The second is on lifestyle factors to lower blood pressure. The third is on how to manage uh, high blood pressure um, with and without diabetes in CKD. The fourth is on the particular subgroup of those with a kidney transplant. You certainly have uh, those uh, patients. Um, and the fifth is on the management in children. As I highlighted in red, in my talk, I will focus on blood pressure measurement first and then on blood pressure measurement. But I'm happy to take questions on all the other chapters or other aspects that, that you may have. Um, and you can note it down and you certainly have time after my talk to uh, venture into any questions that, that come up in patients with CKD. But let me stress again that it is in patients with CKD, not on dialysis. Dialysis patients are so different. Trials are so different in those on dialysis, as you know, as unfortunately, so that we focus particularly on the patients um, that are not on dialysis. Okay, that said, let's go into the first part of the guideline that I will uh, um, explore, which is on blood pressure measurement. And I think that's a very important aspect because we recommend not a routine or measurement of office blood pressure, so what you sometimes call casual blood pressure, but we recommend standardized office blood pressure so that you do it always in the same way. And I will explore how this is done. And that recommendation is graded 1B. And I will tell you why this is graded 1B in a, in a moment. Um, it is graded 1B because it is in, was employed in all large randomized trials. Uh, I will show you a number of trials, including, however, a cord and sprint. So in, in other words, it's not because standardized blood pressure measurement is probably more precise or whatever, but in all trials that investigated or examined how should I manage blood pressure, standardized blood pressure was used. That's the reason why we recommend it. And what it means is you shouldn't take caffeine and shouldn't exercise and smoke for at least 30 minutes before blood pressure is taken. You should, take, you should have both feet on the floor, arms and the back supported. Both feet on the floor is important. There are studies that crossing your legs raises your blood pressure by five to 10 millimeters of mercury. You should keep quiet. Uh, somebody can be in a room. It's not that you need to be unattended during the quiet phase, but you should relax and uh, you should not take the patient's history or whatever. Should be left at his own. You need to correct cuff size, obviously, and validate the equipment. And then you should take blood pressure several times and take the mean. We take it usually three times. Um, you need some more time. You need staff training and retraining. Uh, and depending on how you do it, as I said, it takes more time, but you probably do not have to do it at every visit. But uh, when you make management decisions, decisions 
our recommendation is take standardized blood pressure measurement. And here is a long list of trials that you probably know, um, which investigated blood pressure, several aspects of blood pressure, including different targets of blood pressure, which drugs are, you should use, what targets you should aim for. And all those trials um, used to wait and rest time. All those trials used several readings. Uh, they didn't use uh, very fancy equipment, particularly in the uh, older times, let's call it. And sometimes they used automated readings, include the, including the sprint trial, which will be a major emphasis uh, of my talk. So that's the reason why uh, we recommend to use standardized blood pressure measurement that everybody can do independent of the device. We are using in our unit now for more than seven or eight years, this machine, when you have this arrow to average of this switch, then uh, once you have attached the cuff, yeah, and you press start, then the, the machine doesn't do anything for five minutes. It leaves the patient alone uh, or leaves him resting or her for five minutes. And then it takes three measurements and tells you the average of these three measurements. So this is taking, uh, is preventing um, losing too much time for our staff. So the nurses love it because they can work in the same room at the same time, but they don't have to uh, do uh, blood pressure measurements, but it's expensive. You can use less, less expensive machines, but then you need uh, the staff to do the readings. And this method, as I will show you in a minute in more detail, uh, gives you readings which are 5 to 15 or 20 millimeters less than the usual uh, office blood pressure that we call routine or casual blood pressure that is not specified how it's done and probably in every clinic it's done differently. That's probably not a good way. That's why we do not recommend to do it. Uh, there are studies and I will show you a particular study that I like but there are many studies that compare the usual routine office blood pressure with the automated method, five minutes rest and so forth, standardized. That's the mean difference of those studies. The same difference for the 24 hour blood pressure readings and not much difference between 24 hour blood pressure measurements and AOBP. Well, a nice study comes from Ajeev Akawal from um, Indiana in the US. He investigated uh, almost 300 patients with chronic kidney disease. Each of our was 30, me, 29. And he measured blood pressure um, in a standardized way and a routine way. The mean difference was that the standard version was almost 30 millimeters of mercury lower in these CJD patients, not on dialysis, than uh, the routine measurement. And that's the variability. And because of this wide variability, you cannot just deduct from your routine or casual blood pressure measurement 30 millimeters of mercury. That would be great if you could do it. But in the individual patient, yeah, the difference is unpredictable. And therefore, uh, we, we have to do standardized blood pressure measurements and cannot, cannot convert one into the other. Uh, that, that's the way the data are, and uh, I cannot change it. I will show you in a minute that not everybody was happy with this recommendation, but for the reasons I just explained, uh, the research, the work group uh, stands to this recommendation. We sent out, this is now a statement of the British and Irish Hypertension Society, uh, on our recommendation one, because we sent out our recommendations a year ago for public review. So everybody could have a look at it and we got about 90 to 100 uh, uh, um, um, responses. 
And one of the responses I'm showing here from, from the British and Irish Hypertension Society, which is saying that it's great that you have a lot of rigor in the measurement of atrial blood pressure. However, it's probably not practical in most settings. Well, it, it may be not practical uh, depending on how your clinic is set. We changed the way in our clinic how blood pressure was measured. We measure blood pressure much less frequently than we did before, but when we take management decisions for blood pressure, diagnostic or interventional, we do it that way. And it works, particularly with the automated method, which is expensive, but it works. And I'm saying this, you are all doctors, you're all nephrologists, and everybody who is reading this guideline, it's a yeah, recommendation and, and it's a target. Yeah? As with other targets in life, we do not achieve yeah. everything. Um, and uh, individualization is key. Yeah. You, we, we, uh, a recommendation in the guideline does not mean that 100% of our patients has to get to these targets, but we have to think of it. And in many patients, however, it may be very reasonable to attain these targets. Why? Well, the major reason is the SPRINT trial. In the SPRINT trial, which was a non-profit funded trial by the National well, Health Institute yeah, well, in the US, so by yeah, yeah. taxpayers' money, uh, it was explored whether a target below 120 was better or worse or identical to a target of less than 140 millimeters of mercury, systolic, diastolic, not defined, in patients with hypertension. And this trial said <laughs> we want to have a large group of patients with CKD. And the results of the CKD subgroup is shown on the right. Uh, the primary outcome is given on the ordinate here for the whole group uh, and here for the CKD subgroup on the right. So the lower target red, the higher target blue. And the difference, the achieved difference in blood pressure was about 15 millimeters of mercury. The achieved blood pressure in this group, in this group was 123 mean, and here the achieved blood pressure mean was 121 in the entire group. And not only was the primary outcome, which is defined here, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, congestive heart failure, cardiovascular death, was it different? Um, the, the similar result was found for all cause mortality. And the trial, I'd like to emphasize, whatever did we discuss, had to be stopped early because of ethical reasons, because the group, this group, the lower group, had a much reduced mortality. So survival was much better in this group, particularly in the group with CKD, also in the group with CKD. That's why this trial was stopped early. And there was so far no other trial who explored these low targets but SPRINT had a clear message. Uh, this effect on mortality is supported by a recent analysis by Joe X's group in San Diego, who looked at 18 randomized control trials, all exploring uh, patients with hypertension and different uh, levels of blood pressure. And he, they extracted from those non-CKD trials, but also SPRINT, they extracted only the patients with CKD. Uh, so what you see here is data that refer only to patients with CKD. Uh, and they found a lower mortality also here, odds ratio 0.86. When the chief blood pressure, highlighted here in red, was below 125 as compared to 125 to 135 or below 135. So that's uh, consistent with the results of SPRINT, which was a randomized control trial. And here that's a meta-analysis of other trials. 
uh, a lot of people said, well, that's nice what you're saying, but can you really lower blood pressure in those above age 75 or above, above age 80, particularly also in those with um, CKD, to lower levels? Uh, will you not cause more problems than more benefit? Well, it's the opposite. Particularly in those with uh, advanced age, it's also true for those above age 80, up to ages around 85. The lower blood pressure goal, achieve blood pressure 123 in sprint senior, achieve blood pressure 134, odds ratio for the primary outcome, huge difference in favor of the lower blood pressure goal. Similar results in the older part the population of the CKD subpopulation. That's also true for all cause mortality, huge benefit in the older ones. Uh, and to the surprise of some, uh, no difference in the total um, severe adverse events, no difference in orthostatic hypertension, hypotension, or injurious faults. Yeah, no difference. Um, that's true for those with CKD, it's true for those age above 80. And um, similar benefits in those with CKD. How about the brain? Well, we don't want to be uh, or become demented, don't we? Lower blood pressure goal, less development of dementia. Unfortunately, as I said, because of the mortality benefit, this trial had only a mean duration of uh, close to three years. So a few patients later on, and for the development of dementia, you need time. Uh, there, therefore, I think we need further trials to explore this um, surprising benefit, but intensive benefit for uh, problem dementia or mild cognitive impairment of the lower blood pressure form. Any problems? Yes. Um, acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury was somewhat more and, and significantly more uh, frequent with intensive blood pressure uh, therapy compared to standard therapy. However, acute kidney injury as a rule was mild, yeah? mainly an increase in creatinine, and it was not, um, it was not sustained. There was complete resolution in most patients, somewhat around 90% after some time, AKI requiring renal replacement therapies or dialysis, few patients, and renal disease, five patients in total, not many. Um, a further argument uh, against or from those who reviewed our guideline before we published it, uh, against the target below 120 was, but nobody else is recommending this. And based on the same, based on the same evidence, different uh, organizations recommend different blood pressure targets for CKD. Well, that's normal in science. It's not opinions that vary, but the recommendations vary because the, uh, the way we analyze the data and the way we consider the importance of targets, uh, different recommendations come up. In the US, for CKD, it's 130. In Canada, it's 120, like in, in, uh, in uh, the, the Kidigo publication. It's also in Austria. ESC gives a range. NICE gives a huge range for those with CKD. Some give also a diastolic uh, target, but we stand to the target as you formulated and the measurement that uh, I showed you. How about kidney outcomes? So far, I was talking about how we should measure it. I was talking about the targets. I was talking about why these targets are important, namely uh, uh, sorry, namely cardiovascular outcomes and mortality. Why should 
probably stress it otherwise, mortality and cardiovascular outcomes. But how about kidney outcomes? I was only talking so far about um, AKI, which was more frequent in those with a lower blood pressure goal. Well, uh, when we look at GFR over time, in the patient with CKD, CKD subgroup, starting CKD, uh, starting GFR was in the range of 50. Uh, initially, um, um, faster decrease in those with intensive treatment. And thereafter, however, also, there was a slight difference between the groups, but there was a difference not in favor of the uh, lower blood pressure goal, but with the higher blood pressure goal. There was no difference in end disease or doubling of CM creatinine, but that difference was there not to uh, the favor of the lower blood pressure goal. However, if you look at urine albumin excretion rate, this was better with the intensive blood pressure goal compared to the standard blood pressure goal. Now, how this will then uh, work out over the long term for the outcome that we, we are all interested in, namely end-stage kidney disease, the is transplantation, we don't know. A lower uh, urine albumin excretion rate is usually associated with a better kidney outcome. Uh, a, a, a higher GFR is usually associated with a better kidney outcome. We have to explore it in long, longer term trials. Yeah, that's quite obvious. And there may also be uh, some modification of the renal protection depending on proteinuria. This is data from a study called AASK, the African American, only African American. Um, patients who were involved in this study, which randomized patients to a goal of about 140 over 90, this mean arterial pressure, or around 125 over 70, this mean arterial pressure. And you see patients with a higher proteinuria and the lower proteinuria. So this is microalbuminuria or less, and that's upper range microalbuminuria or more, macroalbuminuria. And for those um, with definite proteinuria, it looks like the lower blood pressure goal is better than the higher blood pressure goal for the outcome of um, end stage kidney disease or doubling of same creatinine, and not for the lower blood pressure goal. This has to be studied in, in further longer trials because that's what you see here is a post hoc analysis of the ASK study. I will finish by looking shortly uh, at the drug treatment strategy that we propose. Uh, when you use one pill, we advise that you start usually if blood pressure is uh, not too close to the target, well, as it usually is, you start with the combination of an ACE inhibitor or an ARP with a calcium channel blocker or with an ACE or ARP plus a diuretic, depending on the patient. Uh, if you have hypervolemia, if you have edema, then you may prefer the diuretic, for instance. And uh, if this is not enough, the next step in our recommendation is to use ACE or ARP plus the calcium channel blocker, plus a diuretic. Now, if this doesn't work, then you have to look for the patient uh, and add, for instance, spironolactone if uh, serum potassium levels are in a range that you can do it, or an alpha blocker, or a beta blocker, or something like dihydralazine or minoxidil, drugs that we use a lot, uh, but which are not used by, uh, in our country at least, by physicians that are not nephrologists. Uh, to summarize, <clears throat> we propose a blood pressure target below 120 in patients with CKD not on dialysis. To, if you use this target, you must use standardized measurements uh, because routine blood pressure gives too erratic uh, data. 
Um, it we propose this target because it has in the sprint trial uh, favorable um, effects on cardiovascular outcomes, brain outcomes, and particular survival, and a favorable benefit risk ratio, even in those beyond age 75. There is, as we admit, uh, less certainty in those with diabetes. If you look at the ACCORD trial, but that's another story. Uh, in those with the GFR below 20, which are very close to dialysis, that's a very specific and, or special population. In those with the proteinuria above one gram, because they were excluded from the SPRINT trial, the very old, and I'm talking about very old, so that's <laughs> depending on your own age, but let's say beyond age 85, the very frail, but I mean, patients with a very reduced life expectancy, there is no need to speak too much about blood pressure goals. Um, uh, the optimal systolic blood pressure over may not be 100, below 120 or below 140, may still be below 120. Uh, look at individualized targets, please. Look at your patient, but I've explored the benefits of the lower blood pressure goal. And with that, I thank you a lot for your attention. It's uh, further in the evening at your place, and I'm happy to take any questions also on the other chapters of the KD guideline in patients with CKD, not on dialysis. And I thank you a lot, and I thank my work group a lot, who spent a lot of time in the last two years to compile this guideline. And I hope you will have some uh, joy and um, some pleasure exploring the guideline in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Mann. That was uh, uh, a brilliant and uh, many particularly timely in, in our environment um, where we, we, we are dealing now, I dare to say we are dealing with an epidemic of, of CKD. Mm -hmm. And particularly those in yeah, uh -huh. analysis and uh, um, uh, focusing on trying to uh, prevent progression is, 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 is the daily question I ask myself while seeing mm. patients. Yeah. And I'm, I'm uh, uh, decreasing the, uh, the uh, uh, blood pressure goal target um, uh, sounds quite convincing that it is uh, uh, helpful. Um, mm. There's a, a before I allow other people to um, come on in, is um, you mentioned that pro in proteinuria, it's not so certain in proteinuria. Mm -hmm. And I, I find this very interesting why uh, uh, um, uh, this target, you, 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 you bring that up. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Is there explanation why? I, I thought if you can... Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only, I have two answers to that important question about proteinuria and blood pressure goals. One is in, sprint, in the SPRINT trial, patients, I don't know why this was not a wise decision, decision but in, in those with the proteinuria above one gram, they were not included. They were excluded from the SPRINT trial. So therefore, there is less certainty. However, when we look, and therefore I showed the slide at the AAS key study, yes. um, which is very relevant to, to Africa, because only African Americans were included. That study clearly says when there is proteinuria, the lower blood pressure goal is better. So we are pretty convinced, based on the ASK study, um, that the blood pressure goal of below 120 is also um, appropriate for patients with proteinuria above one gram, uh, or if I may say so, it is very important for those patients. And in, in my clinic, where I see many patients with proteinuria above one gram, we try to lower blood pressure below 120 um, because of the proteinuria but uh, we are not always successful. I find, yeah, yeah that's uh, absolutely. Now, 
central to your targeting is the standard measurement of blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And of course, you do mention that uh, I might not be, it might not be so practical. Huh? Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe let me just throw it through my, my other colleagues in their clinics. Uh, um, uh, if they think they're, uh, <laughs> next time you go to a clinic and ask that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, uh, you talk about less frequent measurement. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, you, you talk about it's when you want to make a therapy changing decision. Mm -hmm. And so how, how often is uh, less frequent? Well, it, it depends on how well I know a patient. Let's assume I have a, a patient who is the first time in my office, then I do it uh, on the next few times he's coming in again in a standardized way. Uh, and if he then comes, let's say every three months, every six months or so, uh, some, for instance, sometimes uh, patients who are transplanted, in that case, I, rel I rely uh, on his home blood pressure measurements. And if I want to change his drugs, his hypertensive drugs, then I tell the nurse to do a standardized blood pressure measurement. Uh -huh. That's the way I do it. So it may be that it's only every four to six months that uh, it's done in the way I described. Yeah, so I, I find home blood pressure measurement quite, quite important. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about the evidence, but there, there, there's uh, the next best thing to uh, an automated uh, um, ambulatory blood pressure. Absolutely. Um, uh, the next best. So uh, increasingly, I'm getting the clients who can afford to do that, and yeah. I, I enjoy that very, very much. Uh, My question is, uh, Dr. Hans, um, why are we targeting systolic blood pressure mm -hmm. and, and, and not diastolic blood pressure? Okay. Is there any reason why? There's, th that's a very important question. Uh, several answers. Answer one, if we target a blood pressure below 120, diastolic will almost always be below 90. One. Second, um, systolic blood pressure uh, has a, let's say, better correlation or closer correlation with outcomes than diastolic blood pressure. Answer three, uh, in, let's say, the old times, people use diastolic blood pressure in trials because it could be measured more reliably than systolic, so there was less noise. However, um, it, particularly with standardized blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure can be measured now very reliably, and therefore the, the larger trials used uh, systolic blood pressure. Uh, in, in, Kidney disease, we have only four trials that looked at different targets in CKD of blood pressure, different targets of blood pressure, and outcomes. One trial was SPRINT, uh, which used systolic blood pressure. The other trials were MDRD, AASK, and RAIN2. RAIN2 was a small trial. And MDRD and AASK were large trials from the US and both, unfortunately, used as um, blood pressure, mean anterior blood pressure, which is diastolic plus a third of pulse pressure. And when I talk to colleagues, I don't know how it is for you, your clinic, nobody uses mean anterior blood pressure. Everybody uses systolic or diastolic blood pressure. So this was a long answer, but that's the reason why we are not talking about diastolic blood pressure in this uh, uh, recent guideline of Cadigo. Yeah, yeah. so um, Professor, the patients who have uh, isolatedly uh, diastolic hypertension yeah. uh, and uh, not systolic hypertension. So mm -hmm. in the, those particular patients, uh, you know, yeah. we will need a target, you know. True. Uh, so how will we do that? while it, uh, yeah. the guidelines recommends only systolic blood pressure True. Uh, target, yeah. 
the, the, the usual target in, in most, um, from most societies that looked at this question was below 80 when, you, when it comes to CKD patients. When it comes to patients without CKD, it depends a little bit uh, also on gender, whether female or male. And it's somewhere, maybe in some below 90. But for CKD, independent of diabetes or not diabetes, a target below uh, 80 diastolic is very reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Very good answer. Uh, can we get more questions, comments from the audience? I, uh, I have one question, uh, Professor Mann. Thank you very much for that lovely presentation. Very, very clear. Thank uh, you. So uh, less is better uh, <laughs> is a great understanding. Um, my question is, when one talks of oscillatory method in the office, I presume it means using the standardized automated office BP measurement? No, it can be any device that is oscillometric. But you can use, as I said, oscillometric we prefer because it's then an automated, yeah, it's, it's usually automated, um, but you can also use the usual sphygmomanometer. Okay, yes, that's also, so the manual method as well. Yeah. Okay. The key thing oh. is preparation. Okay, right, okay. And another question is, um, how does one complement automated office BP measurement with uh, ambulatory BP and home BP? Because uh, there would be variabilities in the uh, recordings of uh, or the accuracy of blood pressure when you compare three. Well, of course, ambulatory and uh, office would be more or less similar. But when it comes to home and uh, automated uh, office, there would be <clears throat> differences. So how would one uh, take that into account? Yeah. Two answers. One, very simple. In all trials, and I'm, I'm, I'm a, a fan of large outcome trials, and I'm also boss and I am part of large outcome trials. In all hypertension outcome trials, standardized blood pressure measurement we use. And therefore, my advice is, and the advice of Kidigo, is to use standardized because of that. It's not a question of, about precision. Okay. Now, the second part of my answer, however, is that um, whole blood pressure is very helpful because when the patient comes, then you have uh, his mean measurement at home. Uh, usually a number of measurements. I tell my patients, before you come to see me, for the five days before you come, measure blood pressure in the morning and in the evening twice and bring those values, yeah? And then I have a range of data. I can take the mean and go from there to advise the patient uh, for further management. However, uh, there is no, uh, and, and a home blood pressure has a good correlation to outcomes better than routine office blood pressure. That said, however, there is so far, unfortunately, not a single trial that has used home blood pressure or ambulatory blood pressure measurements in the large randomized outcome trials, except in kids. In children, uh, ambulatory blood pressure measurement is key and was used in outcome trials. But in adults, uh, there is just no interventional outcome trials that had used anything else than standardized measurements. Thank you All right, so much. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, thanks so much, Prof, for that lovely presentation. We've learned a lot. I just wanted to know, um, are there any non-pharmacological uh, approaches that you would recommend for um, treatment of or rather control of the blood pressure because some of these patients with resistant hypertension have so many medications yeah. and sometimes I feel like I wish there were other ways in which we could try and bring down the pressure so I wonder mm -hmm. in your in your wide experience what 
have you seen to work mm -hmm. out there other than medications? Yeah, very important question. Your question is two parts. One is non-pharmacological um, interventions, very important. Uh, what works also in CKD patients is a low sodium, low salt diet, if, if feasible. Uh, that works on the one hand by itself, moderate change in blood pressure by itself, but it works quite well when you combine it with ACE inhibitors or ARPs. And it works also quite well when you combine it with diuretics, by the way. So that's one. Second is, is weight loss, but weight loss is, is very difficult. Um, in, I mean, one in, one in five patients whom you recommend losing weight probably can lose weight and, and weight is lost. So, so weight is so well regulated, it's difficult. But changing the diet to a low sodium intake should be feasible. The next part of your question was, we have so many patients, true it is, who have already so many medications uh, and still do not attain goals and what to do. In, in the sprint trial, it was looked at the subgroup of patients who had more, four and more antihypertensive medications. And they also, they received more medications and they were better off with more medications, sorry, than with less medications. Uh, what he used is, is uh, not easy to tell. What we do is we use a lot of minoxidil. That's a drug that is very effective, but not very easy to handle. But if you use it for a while, you, you know that you have to add the beta blocker because it usually causes tachycardia and you, you, you need uh, uh, potent diuretics or high ceiling diuretics because it may cause some edema. But apart from that, it works well in men. Problem is hair growth. So it, it, we do not use it in, in uh, female patients. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Prof. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, my concern is we have a um, patient with uh, very wide pulse pressure, especially it seems like uh, they have uh, uh, systolic hypertension. Uh, on top of that, also they have cardio um, coronary arterial diseases. So we are willing to 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 drop that much uh, 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 diastolic pressure mm -hmm. because maybe they ha can have uh, um, 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 uh, ischemic heart. Yeah, the, the, uh, it's disease and so forth because yeah. of the diastolic. Um, um, uh, uh, during the historic, the, the heart is getting blood. So um, um, my worry is lowering the, 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 the pressure. Sometimes we um, uh, increase the uh, uh, positive pressure. So is it possible, uh, ca ca how can we handle this anyway? Yeah, it, it, it's an important question. And so far by trials unanswered, question. In the guideline, we recommend that diastolic pressure, blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure should not be lower than 50 millimeters of mercury, because as you said, the heart is only perfused during diastole. It's not perfused in systole. That's one, that's perfusion. But second, if you lower blood pressure, you remove, you remove a lot of work from the heart. And therefore, a lower blood pressure has also advantages for the heart. Trial-wise, this question, what is the, uh, uh, the, the, the nadir of diastolic blood pressure for coronary perfusion? That question has not been answered so far. In uh, the, the SPRINT trial and also in other trials, it, uh, if you look at the subgroup with a very low diastolic blood pressure at study entry, so at baseline, by that I mean diastolic blood pressure 
um, of 65 or lower. In those patients, diastolic blood pressure below 64, then randomized to below 120 or above 120, uh, sorry, uh, below 140, those below 120 had a benefit again, similar to the others compared to those with a target blood pressure below 140, despite this low diastolic blood pressure at trial begin. That's, so that's in the end an unanswered question. All right. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor. Sorry, Dr. Can Kanend, I, I think. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question, please? I, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Thank you so much, Professor Mann, uh, for that lovely talk. Um, it was really informative. And um, but uh, I'm a pediatrician, oh, okay. so the thing is, I'm not going to burden you with pediatric questions. I think that's going to be very unfair. I just want uh -huh. to bring to your attention that. You know, most pediatric trials look at ambulatory blood pressure, right? As you said, right? And the thing is, in developing countries, it's very difficult or, and costly to measure ambulatory blood yeah. pressure. So when we did a trial, we actually did what you did, and that is we used standardized office blood pressure monitoring, okay? So we kind of rested these kids, we did the blood pressure, then we gave them a five minute break in between and then the three readings and has KDGO got any uh, other um, recommendations as to what you should do in countries where ambulatory blood pressure is very expensive? Well, we address this problem in, in, in KDGO and we said if AVPM is not available, which is yeah. more often the case then not, uh, standardized blood pressure should be measured, okay? Yeah. And when we developed the guideline, uh, just as an anecdote, uh, one of our work group members was from Harvard Medical School in the US, so you would think they have tons of AVPM machines, <laughs> but there the wait time for an AVPM measurement is three months, yeah? So in, in this, which country? So it's very appropriate what you're asking. So do uh, um, the usual psychobanometric measurement, one. Second, lower the, 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 the advice is lower blood pressure below the 50th percentile yeah. for the age of the child and use an ACE inhibitor or an ARP. This advice comes from the ESCAPE trial, yes. particularly in patients who have a proteinuric kidney disease. Oh, thank you. That's, that's uh, very um, good because, you know, we don't have access to ambulatory yeah. blood pressure monitoring quickly. And also in a very young child, it's extremely difficult to do. Yeah, that's because true. Because of the Absolutely. fact that they are very restless and you know, yeah. the cuff comes off and everything happens. Yeah. So, you know, the readings you get are very erratic and very difficult to interpret. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's a good recommendation from Katie. But thank you very much. I wouldn't burden you with more pediatric questions. Yeah. <laughs> <It must help. laughs> you can. I think that's a... <laughs> I, can. No, I'm giving I, can. I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have to uh, uh, interest to declare. I have to give a talk to the same forum on pediatric hypertension, so uh -huh. I'm going to borrow all your slides. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do it. Send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll forward it. I will. I will. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof, and uh, for, for all the uh, questions and the discussions. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, enjoyed this. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I hope the whole audience. Um, I enjoyed and uh, and we have learned something um, uh, this evening. Thank you very much, Professor. Have a good evening. Yeah, so and, uh, thank you, thank Prof. you Easy way home. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Professor. It was great and excellent presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Particularly <laughs> <laughs> the question. Have a good time. Thank and, you. Yeah, and, uh, and welcome to Tanzania and Africa. Yeah, I will. I will be back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Bye. 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 All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>